Hey guys, today's presentation is all about fatigue and um, how it actually occurs and what causes it during physical activity. Obviously fatigue can happen in everyday life but we're just looking at what happens during exercise. Um, so first of all you have to start off understanding what fatigue actually is. Um, and it's basically the inability to sustain a required exercise intensity. So if you're sprinting, for example, um, and you can't sprint forever, you have to slow down, that's fatigue. So whenever you have to slow down or you have to stop, that is fatigue. It's found at three different levels. Um, you can get fatigue just at a local muscular level. So for example, if you did a repeated action like um, a bicep curl over and over again, eventually that bicep would tire out that's fatigue. Um, you can end up with general fatigue, which means no particular muscle um, is tired. It's just your general state of um, fatigue in the body and also in the mind. And then there's chronic fatigue, which is actually quite a negative situation to be in because you've either had a training schedule or a competition schedule that's too intense. There's not enough rest days in between and your body hasn't had enough time to recover and repair itself. Um, and that type of fatigue actually takes quite a while to um, get out of or to repair, I suppose. There's three types of fatigue when we're actually looking at physiological reasons. So there's fatigue um, as a peripheral muscular fatigue, so it's just in the muscles. Central fatigue, which is the brain and the spinal column. And then there's thermoregulation, which is how well you can treat you can control your body temperature. So peripheral muscular fatigue is um, all about what happens in the muscles. So you might run out of fuels, which is fuel depletion. Um, there, you might build up wastes, which is accumulation of metabolic byproducts. Um, or there might be a case of impaired muscle excitability, which we'll go through um, later on. All right, so fuel depletion, there's three main fuels that we concern ourselves with when it comes to muscular fatigue. Um, ATP, um, so we all know that they sort of deplete two or three seconds into exercise because the stores aren't that big in our muscles um, and that has to be resynthesized using the energy systems. Phosphocreatine, um, that is a major contributor to fatigue, particularly at high intensity exercise levels. So Nearly all the stores are completed in the first 10 seconds of high intensity exercise um, and can't really be recovered unless you're doing a, a passive recovery. Muscle glycogen um, is a little bit more complex and depends on the intensity of exercise that you do. So if you're doing a high intensity exercise, usually the stores will be depleted between 40 and 60 minutes. Um, but if you're doing a submaximal exercise, say just jogging, um, or walking, they may de be depleted in 90 to 120 minutes, which is quite a long time. Um, as the glycogen stores actually deplete, what happens is the body recognises that it will need to keep going, even though those levels will get lower. Um, so it starts to boost up the use of fats. Now, when there's a point where fats actually take over from glycogen as the predominant fuel um, contributor, then there's a situation that athletes refer to as hitting the wall. So the reason for that being is that um, fats have a higher oxygen requirement to be processed with. So when they swap, or when the body swaps from glycogen to fat, there's an increased demand for oxygen and the body responds to that by having to slow down because um, there's, there's too much intensity to actually get that oxygen delivered to the muscles. So the body has to sort of slow down a bit and um, ease up because it can't handle the, the intensity at which um, the oxygen is required. So when the fats are processed, it takes um, a lot more effort for the body to um, process them. So the body simply can't maintain the exercise level and process the fats at the same time. One has to give out and it's the intensity of the exercise. Right, so accumulation of metabolic byproducts, like I said earlier, that's just basically a buildup of wastes. So um, a, a main one is hydrogen ions. And the hydrogen ions come about when lactic acid um, splits into lactate and hydrogen ions. So they um, actually create um, an issue or a, or a state in the muscles and it's called muscle acidosis and that means that the pH level actually drops down 
it makes the muscle um, area quite acidic and that's not a very good environment for the glycolytic enzymes to function in. So enzymes in our body help speed up processes. Um, glycolytic enzymes help um, with the process of glycogen. So if those enzymes are being tampered with or they, they can't actually function because the um, environment is um, too acidic for them, then they will stop. And so then the process of um, actually creating energy via glycogen is also stopped. Um, the hydrogen ions are also thought to mess around with the calcium ions um, that are a key player in the contractile process. So to do with the actin and the myosin in the sarcomere, um, when hydrogen ions build up, um, they start to play about with the levels of the calcium ions. So hydrogen ions are quite a negative thing to build up and um, particularly when you work anaerobically, that's when they'll start to build up even more. Inorganic phosphates um, are a little less serious. Uh, they're created when the ATP and the PC split and you end up with some free phosphates. Um, and the exact mechanisms aren't really understood about what they do, but they think they've got a similar role to the hydrogen ions where they play about with calcium um, during the contractile process. Same for ADP. Um, again, um, it's not highly understood, but um, it thinks they think that they're also um, playing around with calcium ions. So you've got three different um, metabolic byproducts that are basically trying to inhibit or not trying to, but do try to um, inhibit the contractile process. Um, and that, that's an issue because obviously if you want to exercise for prolonged periods of time and your muscles can't contract, then you can't move. Now, um, in the past, lactic acid used to um, be considered as the bad guy, um, that it would stop um, contractile processes or it would cause fatigue. The reason being was that in... Um, Earlier testing, what they found is when the muscle starts to fatigue, lactic acid levels go up. Now, um, that's that's just a, a circumstance or a coincidence that that happens. It's not actually a cause and effect relationship there. So lactic acid is no longer thought to cause fatigue. Um, and in fact, it has actually started to earn a good name for itself because scientists have started to discover that it may actually play a role in creating um, positive environments in the muscle um, for, um, for muscular contraction. Okay, so impaired muscle excitability just basically means that um, it's whether the muscle actually gets stimulated by the neuron or not. Um, there's a chemical potassium that can build up in the muscle fiber um, in the T tubules and they can actually reduce the ability of the electrical impulses to stimulate or excite the muscle. Um, so if they build up, they sort of clog up the little tubules in there and they stop messages from getting across and firing. Um, and so obviously the muscle can't get stimulated and therefore it can't contract properly. All right, so central fatigue, there's really only two areas that you need to know about this. Um, one is that um, there's a thing called a neurotransmitter. In this case, it's acetylcholine. And that's what um, takes the message from the neuron or the nerve to the muscle fiber itself. Um, and it crosses a little gap in between the neuron and the muscle fiber called the neuromuscular junction. Now, what happens is during prolonged exercise, levels of acetylcholine actually reduce. Um, it's not really known why, but it's thought that uh, the body actually puts sort of um, mechanisms in place to stop the body from overworking um, and driving itself to death, and this being one of them. Um, also, there's another interesting thing that, um, say for example, you're mentally fatigued, um, your motivation levels may have dropped, your um, brain can actually respond to that physically and um, stop firing off as many signals as it would. So if you're getting towards the end of the competition, you've just got no motivation left, you just don't care about it anymore, um, and you've still got plenty of energy in your muscles, and you've got um, everything else is tip-top, it's just your mind that's fatiguing, uh, your brain can actually respond to that. 
um, and stop sending signals on your brain or on your mind's behalf and then you will actually slow down as a result. All right, so thermo, thermoregulation, there's three different areas. Uh, there's hypothermia, um, dehydration, and hypothermia. We'll have a look at all three. So hyperthermia is an overheating of the body, usually when temperatures um, go above 37.5. Um, and I suppose it's normal that your body actually heats up when you exercise because heat is a byproduct of aerobic respiration. The problem is when you overheat. Normally, um, you are more at risk of overheating in humid conditions because um, the heat is actually expelled um, via sweat and um, you can't sweat as well in a humid condition because um, there's more water in the air, there's more water vapour. So the, the, the um, water on your skin just simply can't leave it and dry up into the air because the air is already saturated. Um, the other problem is if you're exercising in um, conditions that are too hot, say 40 degrees, um, then those high, but, uh, those high temperatures outside are more likely to contribute to your overall core body temperature. Now, one of the issues with your body's response to heat is that when you um, need to cool down, um, naturally the blood will take the heat away from the muscles and to the skin um, via vaso vasodilation, and then the heat will leave um, because of the sweat taking it out with it. Now, the problem is that um, that only works to a certain degree. If the um, body takes away too much blood from the muscles and sends it to the skin surface, then you end up with not enough blood left at the muscular site. And that means there's not enough oxygen being delivered. Now, if there's not enough oxygen delivered, then the muscle struggles to work aerobically and has to switch over to anaerobic energy systems to produce energy. Um, and then that will actually cause a greater level of fatigue because of the intensity increase. Alright, dehydration, um, there's three types, hypertonic, isotonic and hypotonic. So it will just depend on whether you've lost salt, um, water or a combination of both. Normally it's a combination of both, so the isotonic dehydration. And the cause is usually because you haven't had enough fluid intake before you started exercising or because there's been excessive sweating during the exercise. Um, now it's an issue especially because at only 2% of total body fluid loss um, you can have an impaired performance of up to 20%. Now a lot of that is mental and it's physical. So it's not just one or the other. Um, your brain can stop thinking properly. Um, so that's an issue in um, sports that re revolve around um, say tactics and decision making and also um, just heavy um, physical performance will decrease. At a loss of 6% or more, um, it can actually cause unconsciousness, which has been known to happen in um, extreme sporting events. And then a loss of 15% of your total body fluid is usually fatal, so you don't want to go down that path. Thermoregulation in terms of hypothermia means that you haven't been able to regulate your body temperature in the cold, and it means that your um, body will start shutting down the colder it gets. So if you have a core body temperature of about 35 degrees, that means that um, your body won't be able to function as well as it should be. Um, so generally what happens is the cold works its way from the outside in. So the extremities will be affected first. By extremities, I mean um, fingers and toes, then it will move to hands and feet then arms and legs and so on. So it will sort of gradually creep in from the outside in. Um, at a particular level, um, usually you have impaired functioning physically, which means that your arms and legs actually can't really move very well. So um, you end up having to stay in that one spot, which is bad because if you're in the cold, you want to keep moving and get away from it, but you can't because you can't move. Um, in the end, usually a core body temperature of 28 degrees will result in death. Um, and that has happened especially in, um, say, extreme uh, mountain climbing, say to Everest and those sorts of areas. Um, it can also happen in um, ocean swimming, um, in Arctic areas and that sort of thing. All right, so summary. Um, basically, there's three different types of fatigue, peripheral muscular, central and thermoregulation. 
Um, each three would depend on the intensity of the exercise that you are working at, um, the environmental conditions that you are in, and whether you have hydrated or not hydrated previously to your exercise bout. Um, the next video will be on recovery strategies um, and that will explain how to combat these areas of fatigue. Thanks for watching.